Charles Adams, the creator of the Adams family, once said that the purpose of the Adams family was to show American values in a funhouse mirror. Paranoia, darkness and the sweetness of suburban life. Tim Burton, producer and part director of Netflix Wednesday, said, you know, Wednesday and I share the same worldview. And on that basis, I have to assume that Tim Burton has a deeply confused worldview, one that's focused on aesthetic above anything else. Because if Netflix's Wednesday holds up a mirror to the Adams family, then the only coherent thing that it says is, doesn't this look cool? Although the incoherent things it says by accident are probably far worse. Da 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 this was for copyright reasons. I apologise. When a property is adapted, it's always interesting to see what things are changed and what things stay the same. How the new text interacts with the old text, uh, what it reflects. What do the changes made reflect about our understanding of the media? or of the changing world in which this media exists. So when I saw that Netflix was going to release a Wednesday Adams show, I was cautiously, cautiously optimistic. How are they going to update the satire on conservative and mainstream American values? What changes are made and what things remain the same? At a time when the far right is on the march, when there's rising attacks on LGBTQ people, and when there's a re-emergent traditional values movement where the family is seen as an essential part of far right politics. And critically, quote, the prosperity and well-being of our families is under attack. There's so much, so much room, so much material for the writers to do something fun, critical, and most importantly, coherent. Instead, what we got was a total thematic mess in which the only reflections held back to the audience are sanitised references to past interpretations which understand the Adams family so little that in reflecting them back to the audience, Wednesday drains them of any critical edge in favour of a really narrow aesthetic. In short, the changes are bad, they're, they're baffling, you're going to see me baffled throughout, baffled is going to be the fucking word of this episode, and the things which remain the same in the show are just simply aesthetics. There's, they say nothing. To show just how empty and confused this show is, I'm going to compare it to the two 90s films, The Addams Family and The Addams Family Values, on its representation of the family, of gender, and of the American mythologies of race and colonialism, of, of the presentation of the other. And I picked the 90s films for two reasons. First of all, because I just think they're, they're the best. I just think they're great. They're, they're the best adaptations of the Adams Family. Raul Julia and Angelica Houston are just... Unhappy, darling. Oh, yes. Yes, and secondly, these 90s movies are quite clearly the biggest single influence on the Wednesday Addams series. I know lots of people enjoyed this show, and you're not bad for enjoying it. The creators are bad for making it, uh, but not unlike an Addams Family bad, where like bad is good, more in like a corporate music of Coldplay that gets played in dentist offices kind of bad. That kind of bad. If it wasn't an Adams Family show, it would be a mid-rate CW teen drama, and that's fine. I will say also that Jenna Ortega is extremely good, and if only one person involved in this show understands the character, and I fully believe only one person did, it's Jenna Ortega. So she did a great job. Full props to her. Da 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 da. 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 So for Charles Adams, the whole point of the Adams family was to satirise the American nuclear family. While the Adamses are ghoulish and freakish and seemingly enamoured with inflicting pain and torture. Are you in unbearable pain? 
Is it inhuman? My darling, is it torture? Oui. Their one central defining feature is that they love each other deeply and unconditionally. How long has it been since we've waltzed? Hours. And that's fucking great. The satire lies in exposing the myth of the American family life. Behind the veneer of the respectable white family life with the white picket fence and the 2.5 children is a deeply dysfunctional reality in which the family is absent of love or that love is strained and it's like dysfunctional and people don't listen to each other. This is Charles Adams' fun house mirror. It's as weird for the normal American family to enjoy torture as it is to enjoy your family. That's it. It's simple. And this funhouse mirror is on full display in the two 90s films. The 91 film begins with Gomez staring lovingly at arresting Morticia and saying, I would die for her. I would kill for her. Either way, what bliss? And the romantic, melodramatic love affair is shown in full wonder. And in the 60s, when the original uh, sitcom version of The Addams Family was aired, this notion was scandalous, as depictions of sexual love like this were sort of not found on television and seen as taboo. And in the 90s, where there's like ubiquitous description of your wife as like a ball and chain, an idea which is not, incidentally, satirised by the movies. You still desire me after all these years? The old ball and chain. Forever! I'll get them. Is subverted as these two share total love and total devotion to each other and support and understanding and listening to each other. This is an, an, a simple satire. And in the two movies, the Morticia Gomez relationship is positioned as a, tat as a satire against uh, two different relationships. First against the family's accountant and his wife, who he overlooks and ignores and pawns off, uh, and is like just the best example of, you know, leave him, girl, you can do absolutely better. Which, of course, she does. She leaves him for cousin It, and in doing so becomes an Adams, and in doing so becomes a sort of freakish outsider to American normal values by entering into like a deeply loving reciprocal relationship with the, the freakish cousin It. They're clients, Mark. <laughs> You're a marvelous dancer. It's been such fun. And in the second film, Adam's Family Values, the femme fatale Debbie played brilliantly, brilliantly by Joan Cusack and her instrumental ensnaring of Uncle Fester dispositioned against Morticia and Gomez. Would you die for me? <laughs> yes! Promise. And Fester says several times that Morticia and Gomez's relationship is what, what he wants. He wants to be in this sort of loving relationship. And Debbie adds another layer to this, as she's positioned as like a satire of the misogynistic femme fatale from 1980s movies like Basic Instinct, who represent the sort of fear of disruption of the heteropatriarchal order posed by greedy, economically motivated women. And in the movies, Debbie and her wiles aren't themselves really posed as like particularly negative to the Adams family. She immediately endears herself to the family because she herself is a satire. Her, her biggest crimes are the instrumental ways in which she controls Fester and in which she separates him from his family and places him within a more traditionally American ideal. You have destroyed his spirit. You have taken him from us. All that I could forgive. But Debbie... What? Pastel? Oof, that line delivery is chilling. And it's with the separation of Fester from the family that we can see the ways in which the family's love for their children is positioned against prevailing family values of, of the American sort of traditional family, white family. In breaking up the family, the Adam's new child, Pubert, becomes <sighs> cute. Stay back! He's very sick! The notion that he could become a lawyer or even president. <sighs> he could become president. <laughs> Please. 
is seen as an existential horror born out of this family dysfunction of, of white conservative America. The closer they get to white conservative America, the more horrible it is that, that you could produce a president. Ugh. And this horror of their child becoming president really underlines Adam's family values critique of the conservative uh, family values politics of then President H.W. Bush. The writer of Adam's Family Values, Paul Rudnick, told Hollywood Reporter in 2018 that the movie is written in direct response to the Republican family values, which still refuse to respect or even acknowledge, for example, LGBTQ families. I like to believe that the Adams family is far more loving and accepting than their enemies. Not incidentally, Rudnick's one sentence personal life uh, section of his Wikipedia entry just simply says he's openly gay. And with this context, the Adams family being openly distraught at the notion that their son could become president isn't just like a joke, isn't just about like, oh, everyone wants their kid to become president, but the Adamses are weird, weird and cookie, so they don't. But that becoming president literally means becoming the type of person who would persecute alternative family bonds, like LGBTQ ones. And this is really where the family satire of particularly Adam's family values, which, let's be honest, is the better of the two films. First one's great, but the second one, well, it's like the Godfather 2 of the Adams Family. I'm, I'm sticking with that. It's the Godfather 2 of the Adams Family. Yeah, that's right. And this, like, shining critique can really be seen when the kids are sent away to the camp as a result of Debbie's subterfuge, because, let's be honest, the parents would never send their children away without them absolutely wanting to, and it's a great scene when they send them away because they don't understand why the children would want to go to this camp, but Debbie convinces them that this is something that they want and they're just too scared. And the parents do it anyway because they're like, they would do anything for their kids. They would do anything that they wanted. It's, a, it's a, another great scene. And we'll return to the camp throughout this video, um, but what is clearly set up here is that it's the values of WASPy, that's white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that's what that abbreviation means, basically like that kind of middle, upper middle class white American that the Adams family is clearly satirising. It shows that the values of WASPy suburban white America is, is being directly attacked by this film. The separation of the kids into this world of wasp privilege is also what drives Pubert to become cute. Only once the children are returned, once they outright reject the Republican values, is the family healed and the curse of cuteness lifted. The curse of cuteness, aren't we afflicted by that? Our whole family, together at last. And so the Adams family uh, by including the children, by including the extended family of like Uncle Fester and the granny as a necessary part of the family unit is directly critiquing the nuclear um, family ideal embodied by WASP America. Whereas the nuclear family functions as a small unit of individualized members, the larger extended family is depicted as a network of reciprocal ties and obligations for family members. When this characteristic is portrayed in a critical light, the extended family is revealed as corrupt and corrupting. It is painted as a monstrous, unacceptable form of family organization due to its crippling of individuals' freedom and potential. So the Adams Family movies, and most of the Adams Family, is a simple satire of American family values. It's clear, it's simple, it's not complicated. This doesn't mean that they give like a revolutionary alternative or anything, they obviously don't, but just that their loving devotion to each other is positioned as just as freakish, just as strange to white suburban America as their penchant for murder and torture and the, the gothic. It's a simple satire, it's really really simple and it's hard to fuck up. How then does Netflix's Wednesday approach this? The answer is poorly and, and confusedly. A significant character arc of Netflix's Wednesday is a tension between her, her mother, and her father. My mother's staring at me in a judgmental way. These are all things I've come to expect. 
her worry is that she's being made into her mother's image, that she's being forced into being made into her mother's image and her insecurity in the face of her mother's judgy stare. And recalling that quote from like a minute ago, Wednesday's drive to be her own person outside of her mother's shadow actually fits not with a critique, not with a satirization of the American family, but with an ideal of the nuclear family. It fits with this ideal of the family as a small unit of individualized members. The nuclear family isn't being satirized here, but it's being valorized which is a significant fuck up for the Adams family. And in addition to this, she has uh, disgust at her parents' love. You guys are making me nauseous. And any number of other baffling tensions that any normal teenage girl would have with her parents, which further strips the satire of any meaning. Included in this is the absolutely baffling decision to have the family send Wednesday away against her will to a boarding school. What does this decision tell us about how the Adams family differs from a normal family? A normal conservative family? A normal American family? A normal WAS family? What does it tell us? Does it just place them in a position of extreme privilege? What purpose does it serve to remove them from the suburbs? And I think this is actually part of how they generally fuck with and seem to sanitize the rest of the family too. No longer as pugsley, just as sadistic as Wednesday, but he's just like, he's now just basically a normal kid who likes to eat potpourri sometimes. Gomez and Morticia still love each other, but it's, it's kind of muted, especially in comparison with the two 90s movies. And I don't know how they managed to strip Louise Guzman of his charisma for this role, but they somehow managed it. Like, how do you strip this man of all that charisma? It's, it's baffling to me. It's kind of impressive. And for some reason, the, the, they seem to be worried about, like, committing murder? Like, a whole plot point in Wednesday is her being worried that her dad might be a murderer. Like, why? What, why would Wednesday care about that? This is alongside a sequence where young Gomez and Morticia are terrified while they fight some fucking normie kid and we'll get to the weird and baffling confusing normie versus outsider distinction that exists in this thing later on. Um, but it, it looks like this. I found your father fighting for his life. It was terrifying. <laughs> and they're like scared like any normal person would be when they're in a fight. But when you compare it to this from the Adams family. <gasps> One for you, Tully. So and Wednesday. It was terrifying. Versus this. This. Terrifying. Versus this. What is going on? Why did they do this? And this might seem like a trivial point to make, but this isn't like some cinema sins like fucking plot hole thing. It, it's, I think, part of a way that they've tried to sanitize the Adams family in Wednesday, which I think contributes to a total thematic either confusion or thematic emptiness about what they're supposed to represent in the world. Both their ghoulishness and their devotion to each other is significantly muted, which makes them not a satire of American family values, more of a representation of, well, nothing at all, really. Also, weirdly, they, they didn't have Gomez smoke his cigar in the series, which I guess is a, an effect of like the corporate Netflix platform not wanting to tell kids that smoking cigars is cool, but like, that's very silly because kids smoking cigars, is definitely cool. And if this wasn't Wednesday Adams, all this would be fine, I guess. Just another teen show. But if the point of the Adams family has always been to reflect a critique of uh, the American family values through their sort of deep nurturing relationships which are absent or muted in waspy nuclear families and then juxtaposed against their sort of ghoulishness. What purposes do these changes in Wednesday achieve? W what's the point? What are they trying to say about American families? What is it reflecting? You could say, I guess, that it's not supposed to say anything about American families, just saying something about this specific interpretation 
of the Adams family, but I think that would be a cop out, frankly. All media exists in relation to the world it inhabits, and all interpretations exist in conversation with previous interpretations. So what does this change between the 90s movies and Wednesday actually say? I would argue that by stripping the Adams family of any critique of mainstream American family values and making them just as dysfunctional as any other family in the show, but with, I don't know, like a, a goth aesthetic, fuck you Tim Burton, implies a narrative of progress since the 90s. It implies that a critique of family values is now out of date. Which is, of course, not true as we look around us today and look at the way that family is being mobilised for the far right and the massive groomer panics of LGBT folks and fucking all the terrible shit that's happening right now. It's simply not true. And like, don't get me wrong, I don't think this is intentional. Like, I don't think they're trying to do this. The reason I'm posing so many questions and trying to figure out what's going on is because this show is utterly confused about what it's trying to say and driving anything coherent within it beyond the shallow fucking goth aesthetic is really hard actually. But by incoherently saying nothing, the show exists in conversation with previous uh, interpretations and implies that the um, central satire of the Adams family is no longer relevant and to me that's more depressing than any pithy quip delivered throughout the entire show. So the position of gender in the Adams Family is a little bit more strained than its clear critique of the family. While the Adams Family is generally positioned as a critique, a satire on the white American family value ideal, the satire still places the mother as the head of the household. So you have to remind yourself that it's not suggesting an alternative family life, but it is just a satire. But regardless, there's still like some fun ways in which gender is explored and satirised in the 290s movies. Firstly, we can look again at the wonderful, great, fucking, amazingly performed villain of the Adams Family Values, Debbie. Villain called Debbie is great. So again, Debbie is clearly positioned as a parody of the hypersexualized femme fatales of the 1980s, which is itself uh, an update of classic, like, golden era uh, representation of femme fatales. And it's both a product of the 80s post-feminist notions of women as, like, newly emancipated and the fears of these newly emancipated women to the established hetero heteropatriarchal order. I'm choking over the word hetero. In post-feminist popular culture, pervasive sexualization is more complex than a matter of straightforward objectification. Instead, in keeping with neoliberalism's emphasis on individual choice and self-empowerment, women are presented as autonomous, desiring sexual subjects who actively choose to portray themselves in a seemingly objectified manner because it suits their liberated interests to do so. The black widow seductress of Debbie is clearly a parody of this misogynistic and post-feminist ideal. She finds wealthy bachelors, seduces them, kills them, steals their money to fund her lavish lifestyle. And the Adams family holds up a funhouse mirror to this misogynistic construct by having Fester respond in really weird ways to, uh, to, to the seduction. I'm a virgin. You are? Yes. What's that? He doesn't understand the patriarchal obsession with virginity. He is more interested, more sexually aroused by slaughtering a goat. Fucking king shit. <laughs> by holding up this one house mirror, Fester's seduction highlights the absurdity of this patriarchal male fear or fantasy. And this absurdity is combined with the fact that Tebby just simply can't kill Fester. He's indestructible implying that the sort of heteropatriarchal fear of, uh, represented by the femme fatale is, it just doesn't make sense to the Adams family. It just doesn't apply to them. They, they can't figure it out. 
Uh, it's, it's alien to their world. Debbie's two great crimes aren't being a killer and a thief. The Adams family fucking love that shit. That's, that's what they live for. Instead, it's like I said, it's instrumentalizing Fester's love for her, for her purposes, uh, making it not genuine, making it shallow, uh, and contrast the Adams family's love and splitting up the family to try and live a life of an idealized American, white American wealth. But Debbie, what? Pastels? Again, what a delivery. And you can see how um, what is at issue is the sort of idealization of, of this funhouse mirror femme fatale of the American lifestyle. They, she wants to live in this normal way and they don't. And it's interesting that um, that Debbie has a Latino housekeeper. Miss Debbie! Deborah! That's an interesting little little thing that I noticed. Not quite figured out what it means, but it's interesting. And there's like lots of other wee fun examples throughout the films, highlighting the sort of the, the gender dynamics. One example being, of course, the uh, accountant's wife who dumps her fucking loser shithead husband who doesn't love her and becomes an Adams with cousin it, accepts the entire freakish premise of actually loving your family by becoming part of the Adamses. And it's because cousin it actually listens to her and actually hears her and treats her like a person. Welcome to our family. I can't tell you what it's meant to me joining the Adams clan. We've been so happy. Their, uh, their love affair truly is. It's beautiful. It's probably one of the most beautiful love affairs shown on film. And I will, you can quote me on that. You can quote me on that. Quote me on that. And then there's this line from Morticia satirizing the kind of lean-in feminism where women are supposed to have it all, a family life, uh, a corporate career, except for Morticia, the corporate co career is replaced with summoning the dark hordes. I'm just like any modern woman, trying to have it all. A loving husband, a family. It's just I wish I had more time to seek out the dark forces and join their hellish crusade. And who's to say what's worse, a corporate career or summoning dark hordes to take over the earth? I, I will say that one of them is worse. And finally there's the way in which the kids in the hellish summer camp are divided between like little men and little women who act just like mirrors to their parents. <laughs> which sort of highlights that the summer camp uh, is a location of social reproduction, where the gender relations between waspy American families uh, are, are reproduced, and it's deeply creepy. So while there's not like necessarily a clear feminist theme throughout the 90s movies, there's aspects which give, uh, give like a clear satire and clear critique of the gender regime in the 80s and uh, 90s America. So, how does Netflix's The Wednesday Addams Show, which exists in a time where feminism is resurgent and popular, uh, how does this deal with gender and patriarchy? Confusedly? Yes. So you might think that a show about a competent young woman who knows her mind might be an easy slam dunk for a vaguely competent feminist message. But weirdly, Wednesday fails at that. While she's shown to let nothing stand in her way, patriarchy and gender dynamics are like weirdly absent from this show. Patriarchy is mentioned sparingly and in really weird contexts. Firstly, as a rebuke against someone who's just saved her life. So you were guided by latent chivalry, a tool of the patriarchy to extract my undying gratitude? Mm -hmm. You know, most people just say thank you. Which, you know, makes patriarchy and concerns about patriarchy seem petty and small. Then it's invoked by this character. There's no patriarchy in the hive. Who, throughout the show, makes deeply misogynistic comments. I've always had a thing for werewolf chicks. You ever taken a honey bath? <laughs> Bitch. Bitch. <laughs> comments for which he receives precisely zero condemnation and he's actually held up as one of the central great friends of Wednesday's friend group which really places him firmly in pop culture detectives category of the adorkable misogynist alongside figures from the Big Bang Theory which is fucking great stuff, great stuff, great stuff. 
And then finally, there's an example where Wednesday reacts to one of her fucking boring love triangle boyfriends, miserable sad boy boyfriends, that she uh, that says she looks beautiful by saying this. Wow, you look. A classic example of female objectification for the male gaze. Amazing. Which again doesn't come across as any sort of critique of patriarchy, but as like an aesthetic petulance, especially when it's immediately followed by Wednesday entering the school dance where everyone turns to gaze at how beautiful she is, how desirable she is when she walks in, literally objectifying her, which is, you know, framed as somehow good. Again, the show is confused, confused thematically, and it's confusing to watch. But maybe a deeper problem than these weird sort of aesthetic invocations of patriarchy is that no obstacle that faces Wednesday, nothing that she faces, has anything to do with patriarchy. The, the head teacher she's always fighting with is a woman, her mother is a woman, the queen bee fucking uh, school rival is a woman, and even where men are like obstacles as like the stupid fucking Hyde monster and the uh, reanimated magic evil pilgrim man, we'll, we'll get to that later on, it's weird. These, these are both men, but they're either controlled by or set loose by a woman. Patriarchy seemingly doesn't exist in any real terms in this, in this show, except as a way to I don't know, offer some petulant aesthetic indication, some sort of pithy clippable moment. So rather than like offering some sort of satire of the post-feminist uh, fears like the Adams Family Values does, the world of Wednesday seems to actually exist in a post-feminist world where patriarchy is nothing but a pithy insult to throw around. It's bizarre. And I think this is reflected in like the, the, again, bizarre ways, baffling ways, in which Wednesday is, she declares that she wants to feel more, that she wants to feel more. Honestly, I wish I cared a little more. Why? Why? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? It doesn't make any sense. And this is like particularly set up in relation to the love triangle fucking sad boys who are relentlessly pursuing her and who she's made to feel bad about rebuking multiple times, and she's made, she's made me feel bad about this, which is weird. The show is weird. And in wishing to care more about these fucking sad boys and the people around her, Wednesday ends up matching the sort of self-regulating uh, subjecthood of post-feminism, a sort of post-feminist neoliberal subject. Did you think that you could watch a video on the Adams Family by me? and not get references to neoliberalism. Grow up. Grow up. And in fact, this description of the post-feminist neoliberal subject from Gill and Scharf is spookily close to the sort of characterization of Wednesday Adams in Netflix as The Wednesday Show. To a much greater extent than men, women are required to work on and transform the self, to regulate every aspect of their conduct and to present all their actions as freely chosen. So Wednesday's position as an atomized individual who fits within a non-patriarchal or post-patriarchal system and freely chooses to self-regulate so as not to disrupt the feelings of the sad boy love triangle or whatever and to express her emotions in a much more normal way, uh, learning how to hug and feel. Yay, she's hugged, she's fixed now, she's fixed and she's normal and she fits into the world more normally. That's great, isn't it? What a, what a good message. What a good message for people. And it was her choice as an individual to learn how to feel and to hug, which is connected to her individualistic urge to move out of her mother's shadow. All this positions Wednesday not as a feminist figure, but as a post-feminist one. And as a contrast, the notion that Wednesday should learn how to express feelings in a more normal way is shown to be literally terrifying in the 93 movie. The mirror held up by Wednesday reflects a world in which there are no real problems with patriarchy. A true funhouse mirror. 
And it's weird, it's not as if this hasn't been done recently in, like, similar pieces of media. The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, for example, which is another remake which uh, interacts intertextually with its past interpretations, and um, particularly with like the, the 90s uh, sitcom version of Sabrina, is an explicitly feminist show where strong female characters are, are constantly coming up against and fighting a clear patriarchy. Like it's, it's, it's there, it's in the text, it's obvious, it's not hard to do. And it's in like a similar sort of gothic theme as Wednesday, but done well and not confusingly. Like there's even female villains in that, but they ultimately are subject to patriarchy and it's shown clearly. Not the case with Wednesday. In contrast, Wednesday's post-feminism gives the impression that patriarchy isn't really that big of a deal actually. Um, not anymore anyway. Sabrina uses like an intertextual narrative to critique the previous 90s iteration, which itself fit into this idea of post-feminism. By contrast, Wednesday uses intertextual references to either drain them of any content or as like fun little easter eggs to share on social media. Either way, they're used aesthetically or without pushing any critique. Another way in which this post-feminist Wednesday is deeply neoliberal. Da 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 So the use of the other is a really common, classic trope in gothic fiction and horror. It's often used to highlight issues of bigotry and intolerance, and this was, of course, a classic feature of the Adams family, where the monstrous family, the outsider family, are uh, actually very accepting and more so than the sort of conservative white American family. Importantly also is that the, um, the Adamses are signaled to be a relatively recent immigrant family, whether they are Latino, with Gomez being played by the incomparable Raul Julia. <laughs> incomparable. Or, or the Mamushka, uh, Eastern European dance performed by uh, Fester and Gomez in, in the 91 movie. their ethnicity others them against their white neighbours. But probably the, the best example of this sort of othering going on in, in the 90s films at least is the brilliantly executed summer camp arc in Adam's Family Values. This brilliantly, brilliantly executed arc uh, is a really clear example of how certain people are othered and excluded by a white supremacist American value system. and almost seems like a parody of Netflix's Wednesday itself. And we're all here to learn, to grow, and to just plain have fun! Because that's what being privileged is all about! In the summer camp, all the white wasp kids and teachers, is that a word for them? Camp teachers, camp counsellors, uh, whatever, um, camp adults, they exclude, hate, and abuse the Adams kids. We wish they would just die! Yes! And, and the Adams kids hate them in return, but they're, they're hated by the camp because the Adamses refuse to participate in the rituals of white supremacy, which I think quite incisively includes standards of beauty. And added into the mix for this critique of uh, white supremacy is Wednesday's Jewish boyfriend, who is also excluded from the white supremacist American camp. Again, not incidentally, his position as an actual outsider to the sort of white, white supremacist system makes their burgeoning romance make sense thematically and lends them a kind of outsider chemistry. I die. This scene has more romantic chemistry than any single moment of the entirety of Wednesday Adams of the Wednesday show. But of course the scene which really makes this critique of American othering built on white supremacy and genocide most explicit is the destruction of the self-mythologizing Thanksgiving play. Why you are as civilized as we, except we wear shoes and have last names. <laughs> And important to this is not just Wednesday deciding that this is a whitewashing of American history, but it's 
all the kids who are othered by race, by body standards, by being disabled, they're all coming together to overthrow the white supremacist system. And Important too is Wednesday explicitly describing how this whitewashing, uh, this sort of self-mythologizing of history is connected to the ongoing oppression and othering of native peoples by the white supremacy of this camp, of the whole system. Years from now, my people will be forced to live in mobile homes, on reservations. Your people will wear cardigans and drink highballs. White supremacy and colonialism are not presented as features of the past which are waiting to re-emerge, but are explicitly ongoing systems that all these different other groups are coming together to fight against and to overthrow. Wednesday, Pugsley and all the other kids hold up a funhouse mirror to America's history as a, a direct attack on America's present. It's tight, it's clear, and it fucking rules. So. What about Netflix's The Wednesday Adam Show presented by Netflix? What does this show say about other groups? Well, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, but it's a confusing mess. First the dichotomy set up between the outcasts and normies is baffling. The outcasts aren't outcasts because they don't fit into an ideal of American white supremacy. They are just werewolves, vampires, gorgons and sirens who are all just basically like normal kids with superpowers. They're just, they're just superpowered kids. They're just magic kids. And all of them, they all just treat Wednesday, despite being outsiders, they all just basically treat her like a normie would too, with bafflingly badly written teenage jibes. Let's get this audition over with. Uh, what are you? Alto? Soprano? Or just loco. And this group of Hogwarts knockoff outcasts are contrasted with the normies who are basically the same, but not special magic people. They're just the same. I guess the metaphor, the theme is supposed to be that the normies discriminate and oppress the outcasts, but weirdly in several scenes it's shown that the outcasts actually leverage an immense amount of economic power over the normie town, even pulling the strings on the mayor. So like, who's being discriminated against? Who's being oppressed? There, <laughs> there's a particularly weird scene where Wednesday attacks and beats up a homeless man who's living in the woods outside of town. And I don't know, seems like maybe one of the most outcast people to me. What kind of mirror is this? What's the po why? Why is this happening? What is this saying? And this confusion is intensified and amplified by the bizarre race blindness of the show. While Wednesday is like explicitly uh, Latina, which is great, and uh, again, Jenna Ortega's fucking great casting for this. It doesn't impact her at all. It doesn't other her at all because both the outcast school and the normie town not only have diverse array of, uh, of, of people, a degree of diversity, but black people hold positions of power in, in both locations. Both the queen bee popular girl in the school and the mayor of the town are black and none of these characters mention racism. Despite the fact that the black mayor is being controlled by a white woman, but that white woman is an outsider. So what? What, <laughs> what are you trying to say? In fact, there's one particularly weird and uncomfortable scene in which Morticia Adams attacks the black mayor by saying men like you have no idea what it feels like not to be believed which feels really fucking weird it feels weird it feels weird that that, fe that feels really weird uh, it feels weird that feels weird and in another weird moment in the first episode enid who's fucking wednesday's friend and is white says this Nevermore was founded in 1791 to educate people like us. Outcasts, freaks, monsters, fill in your favourite marginalised group here. Which again feels really, really, really fucking weird because 
do they mean black people? Uh, were they counted as as outcasts, freaks, and monsters, or were they also excluded from this school at that time? By presenting a world apparently absent of racism and patriarchy for that matter too, Wednesday reflects this neoliberal myth of a post-racial and post-patriarchal society and creates this weird space where an outcast is just someone who has lots of money but is a bit weird. Tim Burton, is that you behind the curtain? And this reaches its zenith in the, again, baffling way in which this show treats colonialism and America's founding myth. In an obvious reference to the 93 film, the Normie town revolves around uh, its, its pilgrim founder, uh, this guy called Joseph Crackstone. It even has its own tourist trap village dedicated to him, which is fucking weirdly owned by the mayor, who I remind you, is a black man. What, what, are, you, what are you trying to say with this? I don't know, maybe, maybe Tim Burton's a Du Boisian making a critique about the, the role of the black bourgeois. <laughs> he could be, you don't know. <laughs> also weirdly, all the outcasts seem to absolutely love this tourist trap and they're all really excited to work there. Only Wednesday doesn't like it, offering some pithy and clippable moments telling German tourists that <laughs> And if this was the extent to the engagement with colonialism in Wednesday, this kind of weird reference to the 93 film, I'd be like, ah, you know, it's, it's weird, but whatever. But not even, uh, not even 10 minutes later, Wednesday has a psychic vision. Well, Wednesday's psychic in this show, it's whatever, it doesn't matter. And she has a psychic vision where she sees a blonde haired, uh, ancestor of hers, later confirmed to be, quote, one of the first colonizers of America, uh, and and she tells this uh, this evil Joseph Crackstone that we were here before you, leaving in harmony with the nature and the native folk. That's right, folks. It's good colonizer, bad colonizer time. Good colonizer, bad colonizer. Wednesday, good colonizer. The Joseph Crackstone, bad colonizer, and. What makes a good colonizer? Living in harmony with nature and the natives. Nature equated with the natives. <laughs> what? <laughs> this is baffling and terrible and what are you even trying to say? What are you trying to say? Wednesday's ancestor in this vision then escapes the burning of these outsiders who, again, are not indigenous people or any other marginalized group, but like just these magic, super-powered white people, mostly white people. I just, I can't express how baffling this decision is. I mean, among other things, why, why make a point of hiring a Latino actor to highlight the outsider status of the Adams family to America and then make her a descendant of the literal, the literal first colonizers? Why try to frame some of the colonizers as, as good, actually? What, what? What distinguishes outsiders from normies? None of this makes sense. And it's, it's baffling and has really bad implications. And this all comes to a head in a stupid, convoluted plot line in which a woman played by Christina Ricci in another meaningless reference to a better property uses magic to restore the evil pilgrim who's also now magic which is, again, confusing about who's normie and outcast. If, if being normie means you can also be magic. I, I, I don't... I, I, if they're all magic, who's a normie? Just deeply confusing. And this resurrection, I, I guess, fulfills Wednesday's prediction that... It's about how whitewashing the sins of our past will come back to kill us all. But is this a result of, of whitewashing the past? Who's doing the whitewashing? Is it the normies or the outsiders? Because it seems to be both. And in that case, what are you even trying to say? God, it sucks. Like, like it, in, in Adam's Family Values, the whitewashing of history is explicitly connected to the ongoing oppression of marginalized groups. But 
that doesn't it doesn't make any sense within Wednesday. That doesn't follow from anything. So what is what is it trying to say? Even in this formation in Wednesday, the evil magic pilgrim is a relic from the past, brought back by a single evil lady, not as a product of the ongoing system of white supremacy. And like this merging of the past and of the present is a feature which is common to gothic literature. But done well, this is like used to highlight the sort of uncanny nature of the world in which you inhabit, or to bring struggles of the past into the present, to highlight the sort of ongoing nature of them, to show that they never like really died. But in Tim Burton's Netflix's Wednesday show presented by Netflix, the effect is the opposite. The past is, is presented as a time when the bad things happened. The past was a bad system. And now there are just bad actors who want to resurrect this dead past. Any notion that there's like an ongoing systemic oppression of outcasts upon which this past overt oppression could like make its return could re-emerge, which is, you know, like, that could be a prescient point to make at the time. But this is countered repeatedly by the text, which shows the privileged position of the outcasts over the town, economically, in the fact that the kids are basically kids with superpowers, and that the school stole the bad pilgrim's land. Didn't give it back to the indigenous people though, did they? They just stole the land, so now they own the land and the bad pilgrims don't. So, so who is being discriminated against? And, and what whitewashing is being done? If anything, Wednesday presents a whitewashing of American history by presenting a notion of a good colonist. All of this, I think, is an effect of the post-racial, post-patriarchal, neoliberal ideal in which Wednesday is situated. Rather than holding a mirror to white supremacy and the ways in which it excludes and others a diverse array of people, Wednesday references the 93 film, sort of reflects it back, signals a critique of American systems, but empties it of any content, any thematic coherence, refracting the reference back to us as a shadow of what it formerly was. It's just it's just content. Charles Adams, the creator of the Adams family, once said that the purpose of the Adams family was to show American values in a fun house mirror. Paranoia, darkness and the sweetness of suburban life. And in many ways, Netflix's Wednesday holds up a fun house mirror to the Adams family. And what reflects back is a muddled image uh, that weirdly and probably accidentally reinforces rather than satires or critiques American mythology. It doesn't satirise the American family, but weirdly it ends up kind of valorising it and affirming it. It doesn't satirise the post-feminism of the 80s and 90s, but creates its own kind of post-feminist world. And it doesn't satirise or critique the white supremacist American mythology, but finds a way to kind of hide that white supremacist mythology and create a myth of a good American colonist. The very myth that the 93 movie admonishes. Although maybe by reflecting back at us this sanitised, nostalgia-driven corporate mess. Wednesday's very existence shows us a compelling satire of the current modern age. The meta-metatext might rescue Netflix's Wednesday as an artefact of a stagnant, empty, corporate political culture. So thanks to everyone for watching this video. Uh, this will be the last one of the year uh, and I hope you all enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed making it. Um, uh, if you liked it, then remember to do all the like and subscribe and consider becoming a patron. Uh, um, we'll see if we can continue doing this as for as long as possible and it's thanks to all the patrons that I can keep doing this for as long as I have. So thanks to everyone. And $10 patrons uh, get the renames read out in the credits and I'll just do that now for them. Uh, first of all, we've got Dying of Thirst, Philip McKeegan, FD Signifier, Lizzie G, Quint Wolf, Kim Crawley, Anita Anispe, Ellis Wren, Hey Joe, Quink, Tom Price, Esoteric Fictionalism, Shingo, 
Austin Talman, Rachel Mixon, Rich, Niels Abelgaard, Tinfoil Pancakes, Kieran Gore, Aga Ghost, Daniel Hughes, Tamash Kispeter and Paul Singleton. And thanks for all my other lovely patrons as well who, who are on those lower tiers. I, I love you all too. Um, been a good year. Hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, I'll see you in the new year. Cheers. Oh yeah, and also thanks to uh, the Lickrit guy for reading, reading out a quote and also taking a look at this script. Uh, you should follow him on, on YouTube and everywhere else too. I know it is wet and the sun is not sunny. But we can have lots of good fun that is funny.